John chapter 1, many men have wanted to be God. Many men over the years have wanted to be God. Only one God became man. His name is Jesus. He is the Christ. Isaiah said, actually, his first name is Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. The Son of God became the Son of Man that we, the sons of men, might become sons of God. When God became a man, you know, King Solomon stood in his lavish temple and he said in 1 Kings 8.27, Will God indeed dwell on the earth? Uh, of course he did. If God did dwell on the earth, what would he be like? Everyone would wonder what would he say? What would he do? And he did indeed, because Emmanuel means God with us. This is what we celebrate this Christmas season and all year long. Number one this morning, notice with me Jesus' revelation. We see his revelation written of, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, by the actual revelator, John, here in John 1, and verse number one, notice what it says, in the beginning, what well, sounds a little bit like Genesis, doesn't it? But it's going to sound a little bit like Revelation as well. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Notice the last phrase there, the Word was God, not meaning past tense, that verb tense there is one of continuous action, meaning eternal existence, meaning not only was he God, but that he always was God and always will be. In other words, he never, ever became God. He's the eternally existent one. Three words this morning about his revelation. Think with me of this word we use at Christmas, incarnation. Incarnation. It comes from that word carne. You know, you, you say you're a carnivore. How many carnivores do we have here in the room today? Okay, three or four, and then a bunch of vegans. Congratulations to you non-carnivores. -carn Enjoy your kelp. <laughs> Incarne literally means in flesh. The incarnation is God coming in flesh. What a profound statement that God Almighty limited his dimensions to that of a human body. We seem to picture him with a holy halo, an aura about him, but he was flesh and bone with limbs and hair. He had internal organs. He ate food. That means he processed food just like you and me. He wasn't a phantom spirit. Uh, he who at his core was God was 100% man. God incarnate, the incarnation. God robed in flesh, as much human as we are. Now to illustrate this, I'm going to say something that sounds almost inappropriate, but you will see it is not a question. Were his teeth all perfectly straight? Are yours? <laughs> then I guess not. When he was a teenager, did he get a, a pimple? Did he bite his fingernails? They, there weren't manicures in those days. John emphasizes that Jesus was just like you and me. He got thirsty. He got hungry. He got weary. He got tired. He had to sleep. We see that over in chapter 4 and verse 6. He would wake up. What would his breath be like in the morning? What do you think? He was human. Could he get nose hair? Have you ever seen a Jew? <laughs> oh yeah. If he plucked one, his eyes would water. It sounds almost inappropriate talk like I'm bringing God down to man's level. But listen, I didn't do it. God did. <laughs> God brought him down to our level. And thank God that he did exactly that. Incarnate. 
subject to like passions as we are, Hebrews says, and yet without sin. John 11 says that Jesus sighed, that is groaned from within. You know what that's like as a human to sigh on the inside. It was when he heard of the death of his friend Lazarus. And then John eleven thirty five 35 says he wept outwardly, literal tears, just as on the cross he bled literal blood and his heart literally stopped and he died. The eternal God died in human form just like we do. All these things that we as humans do, he did except the sin part. He's our substitute. Good thing God brought him down to our level. Because we couldn't get up to his. Now think about it. There's no way that we could wrap our heads around this truth of God taking on human flesh. That's why it says in 1 Timothy 3.16, it's the mystery. Great is the mystery of godliness. God manifest in the flesh. What a mystery. What a miracle. The Old Testament often predicts his coming as God, as Messiah. Oftentimes the Old Testament talks about him coming as king. But did you know that the Old Testament also prophesied about him coming as man? As man. Isaiah 53, 3, he is despised and rejected of men. A what? A man of sorrows. Isaiah 9, 6, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. But later on in the verse, it says he's the mighty God. So which is it? Yes, both God and man. In Luke chapter 2, we see the only story of Jesus from his youth, his childhood that is, as he went to the temple and he wisely answered the questions from the doctors and the theologians. They were blown away at his understanding and answers. I'm sure one of their questions could have been, how old are you? In hearing all this come from this 12-year-old boy, how old are you? And if they did, this is just speculation, but he could have answered, well, on my mother's side, I'm 12, but on my father's side, I'm older than my mother and the same age as my father. Oh, and by the way, before Abraham was, I am. He's timeless. All of his human life, he had then this dual nature. He would get thirsty on his mother's side, but on his father's side, he's the water of life. On his mother's side, he would get hungry, but on his father's side, he's the bread of life. On his mother's side, he had no money, no possessions. On his father's side, he owned the cattle on a thousand hills and the gold in the hills. He created the hills. On his mother's side, he did weep that day at that tomb. It was his father's side that manifested itself as he said, Lazarus, come forth. His father's side. It was his mother's side that caused him to fall under the load of that cross. But on his father's side, he bore the sins of all mankind on his shoulders. On his mother's side, he died. On his father's side, he rose. He rose. Incarnation is the first word. And then think with me of the word identification identification we're in verse number 14 John 1 14 look what it says and the word was made flesh that's the incarnation word made flesh then it says and dwelt among us that's identification don't miss this folks the word dwelt there in verse 14 is from the root word translated tabernacle or camp 
camp. And our minds go back to the Old Testament tabernacle, that portable temple that they carried around 40 laps around Mount Sinai. You know our Lord likes camping. Hallelujah! The Lord likes camping. He wants to camp with us. God commanded that that tabernacle be built. And why do you suppose that God commanded the tabernacle to be built? Well, for one thing, it pictured Christ. That's a study all its own. It was a place to worship, yes. But let me give you a very key reason why God commanded the tabernacle to be built. It's because he wants to dwell among us. He wants to camp with us. God doesn't want to watch from a distance. Exodus 25 and verse 8, let them make me a sanctuary, say it with me please, that I may dwell among them. Our God is on the scene. He's on the spot. He's highly involved in every aspect of every day. And in this age of grace in which we find ourselves today, He not only dwells among us, but He's in us. Christ in you, Colossians 1.27, the hope of glory. Emmanuel, God with us. He's with us. He's in us by way of his Holy Spirit. If you have God in your heart today, would you say amen? amen. Isn't it good to know the Emmanuel? Incarnation means he took on flesh. Identification is when he entered mine. He entered my flesh and identified with me. So we have three words here. There's incarnation, the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, identification, and then we see the illumination in verse 14. The illumination, notice it says, and we beheld his glory. Do me a favor and close your eyes for a moment. And think of these truths we are now pondering. And behold his glory. Can you see it? Our eyes are still closed all across the room. So no one will see this but God. But if you are beholding his glory, if you are beholding him born in the manger, and he's glorious. If you're beholding him in that temple at 12, and he's glorious. If you're beholding him right now on that Mount of Transfiguration, as Peter, James, and John did, and you see how glorious he is. If you see his glory on the cross, and his glory as he rose up from the tomb. If you see that that was the reason for it all. If you see his glory as he ascended up on high. Just raise a hand to the Lord right now. He's the only one who will see it. But if you're saying, doing that, you're saying, Lord, I see your glory. We beheld his glory. And all God's people said, Amen. In verse 14, we find that word glory. And there, it's a Greek word, theomai. Theomai. Oh my, this word is pregnant with truth. Theomai, translated glory, is the word from which we get our word theater. To behold something that's like in the limelight. Theomai, it means to gaze at intently. The disciples had a front row seat in that theater. And I want us to be in that theater today as we're in this Christmas season. Think of what it's like to be in that Theomai theater of Jesus and his glory. They had a front row seat. They saw the curtain rise. And we beheld his glory as the spotlight Shekinah spotlight shone on that lovely face and they knew 
They were looking at God. They knew that he was the promised one. They were looking into the face of the Messiah and walking and talking with him, touching him and being touched. John 2.11 says this beginning of miracles, his first miracle, you know it was at a wedding. And it says, and manifested forth his glory. This beginning of miracles he did in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed. We beheld his glory. His miracles manifested his glory. Today I pray that we will see his glory and come to know him better than ever because it's not just a theater production. This is not a production what we do here at church. This is a spirit-led experience with God. We are not an organization. We are an organism. We are the body of Christ. We're not just sitting in a theater being entertained. We get to go backstage. We get to see him face to face. Get his autograph on our hearts. Talk with him. Commune with him. And then afterward, he invites us back to his place. Come to my house. And after many good times there, he reveals that his house is actually now our house, that he built it for us. I go to prepare a place for you. Hmm. You say, I need to know that God. But how do I do that? John 1.12 Look at verse 12 down in your lap. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. That's the point. The son of man, the son of God became the son of man, that we sons of men could become sons of God. As many as received him, received the power to become sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name, we see in that verse the word believe we see in that verse the word receive believe and receive say those with me please believe and receive if you believe say amen, amen. if you've received him say hallelujah. hallelujah oh this is the glorious Christ of Christmas worship him we see in John 1 his revelation from John the Revelator. And then we see his rejection. Look in verse 10. John 1 verse 10 at his rejection. He was in the world and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. 11. He came into his own and his own received him not. How sad. Back in verse 3. All things were made by him. Down in verse 10. The world was made by him. Twice here we see the word made. I believe that God made it all. God created all that is. And if there is a big bang, it is still yet to come. If there is a big bang, it will happen in the future to those who reject Christ as their creator, as their redeemer. Atheists and evolutionists say, Oh, you creationists, you young earthers, believe what you believe, and you just believe it all by faith. Then they say this, We believe what we believe based on science and reason. <laughs> Let me tell you something right now. We all believe what we believe by faith. Because none of us were there. I'll admit I must not have as much faith as those who believe that it all just spontaneously exploded and fell into place the way that it is. They've got a lot more faith than I've got. But I've got a witness who was there. He was there. The fact is, people can believe in whatever they want to believe in. And evolutionists and atheists must really want it badly because they actually set reason aside. Now, what could be a person's motive for setting reason aside if they want to know facts 
Why would you ever set reason aside? What would be the motive for that? Could it be so they don't have to admit that there's a God and answer to Him? Could it be so they don't have to be held accountable for their sin? 2 Peter 3.5 puts it this way, For this they willingly are ignorant of, what? That the word of God, by the word of God, the heavens were of old, that is the creation. That he created it all with a word. Look this way, please. Why don't they believe in God? They don't want to. What a wonder. What a marvel that the creation rejects their creator. You see, when you see art, you know there was an artist. When you see a building, you know there was a builder. When you see design, you know there must have been a designer. When you see creation, you know there is a creator. A creator. In verse 11, we see Israel rejecting him. Did you see that? Verse 11, he came to his own. That's the Jews. His own received him not. Why did Israel reject him? Well, Old Testament prophecies all pointed to him. Jesus fulfilled over 330 direct prophecies. They beheld his glory, his miracles, his miraculous works. Put very simply today, they saw the light and they put that light out. They snuffed it. Israel was not just ignorant. They were willfully ignorant. Why did they not believe? They didn't want to. And when you don't want to believe, no amount of evidence will convince you. Jesus gave them every opportunity to come to the truth. Jesus is the way, but they would not walk that way with him. Jesus is the truth, but they would not believe him. Jesus is the life, and they snuffed it out. They crucified him. Of course, they were just playing into his hand. For from time immemorial, before there was time, he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It was part of his plan to redeem his fallen creation that he knew would fall in his foreknowledge. He knew he was born to die. So, why do atheists and evolutionists reject the Lord? They want to. Why did Israel reject him? They want to. Why do sinners reject him today? They want to. Why don't people believe? They don't want to. Look back in verse number 4. John 1, 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and oh, the darkness comprehended it not. You would think if blind people suddenly saw the light, they would be thankful, but no, they weren't. They weren't thankful. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're in a pitch black room, you're not going to get much accomplished in there. You need the assistance of light. Imagine someone comes along and turns on the light when you're sitting in the pitch black. You'd probably appreciate it, right? Actually, maybe not. There is one reason why you might be angry with the person who turned the light on, and that's if you're in there doing something wrong. John 3.19, this is their condemnation that light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light, say it with me, because their deeds were evil. We're saying they, but I'm saying me, we. It applies to all of us. Now let's have a little fun for a moment. What is the opposite of truth? What would it be? The opposite of truth? I, did, I can't hear what you're saying, though. Falsity? Is that what you said? A lie? Okay. Opposite of truth? 
lie, falsity, any other answers? Um, it's kind of a trick question. In, in our human economy, in basic human logic, the opposite of truth is a lie, right? But in the Bible, the opposite of truth is sin. The opposite of truth, biblically speaking, is sin. Now hang with me and wrap your head around this. The opposite of truth is not error. Error is the baggage that comes along with sin. When we sin, we get the baggage that comes along with it, and that is that we are then walking in error. So the opposite of truth is not error. In the Bible, the opposite of truth is sin. In other words, people reject the truth not because they believe a lie, but because there's a lifestyle that they want to validate and make okay and acceptable. Error is just the baggage that comes with the sin that's the opposite of truth. Let me prove it to you. Our universities today tell young people, you were not created, there is no God, you are not the creation of a God, you are the result of a random series of accidents. And though at first glance that sounds ridiculous, it really resonates with these young people. It really resonates with a person who has a lot of temptation in their life. It strikes a chord with them. They like the sound of that because it lets them live however that they want to live. There's no God. There's no accountability. I came from an animal. I should satisfy my basic animal instincts. It resonates with them. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> that young person doesn't reject the truth for the lie, because the lie is pretty ridiculous. They don't reject the truth for the lie. They reject the truth for the sin that they want to do. Romans 1, 18 says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who, look at this, hold the truth in unrighteousness. That's being willfully ignorant of the truth and choosing the lie because they choose the sin. And then they get all the error that's the baggage for it. It's willful ignorance. So we're about done here. We've seen Jesus' revelation and his rejection. I'm glad it's a happy ending. Jesus' reception his reception, look at verse 12. As many as received him, to them gave he power. We just went over that. Listen, many, I'm glad the word many is in there. Many have received him. And they see the light. And they are born again. And this is why he came. Receiving Christ, believing on him. It's not the same as joining a church. It's not the same as being baptized or confirmed. It's not the same as living a good life or doing good deeds. It's believing and receiving Him. Receiving Christ is admitting we are a sinner in need of a Savior. And that Jesus is that Savior, born to die that we might live. A death substitutionary in our place. And that He rose again, conquering death for you and me. So if we will receive Him we will receive the gift, the Christmas gift of eternal life. Do you want Jesus? I can assure you that He wants you. He left heaven for you. He wants to save your soul. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of the gospel. Born in a manger to die on the cross Thank you for the truth of the gospel. I pray for some to receive and unwrap and open the gift today. And for all of us gathered and watching now who have believed and received, we ask, Lord, that you would receive from us these acts of worship. With our eyes closed, we see you. We behold your glory we worship you. 
we bring you our gold and our treasures and our heart. Fill us with your spirit. May we walk in the truth, the real reason for the season. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Let's stand to our feet as the music begins to play. If you'd like to worship him, come and worship. Come and worship Christ the Lord. This altar is open right now. If you're not sure if you've ever been saved, you can come make sure today you're invited to come. That's number 254. Would you turn in your hymnals, please, to 254? A great Christmas song, Isn't He? Isn't He beautiful? Beautiful. Isn't He Prince of Peace? Son of God, isn't he, isn't he, isn't he wonderful, wonderful, isn't he, Counselor, Almighty God, isn't he? Sing with me, church. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord, he is the mighty king. Master of everything, his name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. He's the great shepherd, the rock of all ages, almighty God is he. Jesus, my Lord. Thank you. Please be seated. We're going to receive our regular Sunday offering.